Welcome to Old Path Ministries and our study through the Gospel of John. Um, where we're going to pick up here, chapter 19, um, we left off at verse 37 last week. So we're going to pick up at verse 38. You, when we get into this, you'll kind of see why it is that I decided to stop here. Because at 37 is the finished work of Jesus at the cross, where he dies on the cross. So when you hear people use the, the terms, hopefully you have, um, they'll, they'll say of Jesus that he conquered both sin and death. And it, it's said often enough that sometimes it might even lose its meaning unless you stop to really consider that. Because in order for something to be conquered, that means that it had some kind of power. And Paul gets into this. Actually, the first, or I'm sorry, the 15th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians is so unbelievably important. And think about it as, as Paul writing 30 years or so, you know, maybe not quite that many, 20 to 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus, then he writes those things to the church at Corinth there. And he wants them to understand the importance of the resurrection. So Paul is somebody who genuinely understands this. Now, as a Pharisee, he believed in the resurrection of the dead. But clearly, he never could have possibly imagined what it would look like and that it was tied to a person, Jesus Christ in this case. So when you read the first, uh, the, the 15th chapter rather of 1 Corinthians, Paul makes such a big deal out of Jesus' resurrection that when we think of him as, as dying on the cross, that was the conquering of the consequence of sin because we could be freed from uh, the bondage of it, and we could be freed from the consequence of it because sin brings about death. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 3. All sin falls short of the glory of God, chapter 3, verse 23. Chapter 6, verse 23 is where he says, and that the wages of that sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in the person of Jesus Christ. So Paul understands this. Not only does he understand how it works operationally, he understands how it works in in what it means to us and how a person can be reconciled to God because of the finished work of Jesus. But again, that idea of conquering. Sin had the power of life and death over us. And because we sin, all fall short, that that consequence to it is death. And that's in the eternal sense. That's not just speaking about the physical bodies. The physical bodies, when they give up, leads to an eternity for every soul that has ever existed question is, where does that soul spend that eternity? And is it in the presence of God or is it separated from him? So again, the conquering of sin, the conquering of death is what we look at here today, because as Jesus resurrects, he then conquers or also re reverses the power that death has over the individual. So Paul says that again, first Corinthians, it's a phenomenal chapter. It's very lengthy and it's incredibly important that we recognize this. Jesus did not resurrect just to some small group and, uh, you know, kind of not, not in the way of being a public kind of a thing. He resurrected and showed himself openly to hundreds of people. And the reason for that is so it's not like the claims of the cults, that it was some private thing to some small group of people and there's no way to verify it. He, he resurrected, and as Paul tells you in the first part of First uh, Corinthians 15, he occurred to hundreds of people, or appeared rather to hundreds of people, and he names a number of those people, the most prominent ones that we would all recognize. And what they all have in common is that none of them uh, denied having seen him. In fact, they went to their death because they refused not to acknowledge that he had act, or that they they refused to uh, distance themselves from the idea that Jesus had resurrected. So it's really, really important. Again, who's willing to get put to death for something that they know is absolutely a lie? So for all of the people who saw him, they went to their death, never denying that they had seen him personally. Because again, they realized, since I've seen him personally, he has conquered sin. He has conquered death. He wouldn't have been put to death if it wasn't for sin. So by being put to death and for his blood being being shed for the, the sin of mankind, then being put to you know put to death and then buried but then resurrecting he completed the whole circuit if you will of what was necessary that was the completion of why he was here on earth the second part that we will see its future to our time is when he comes back to earth and he sets up a kingdom that lasts a thousand years revelation 19 and a forever kingdom after that so with all of that said 
It is massively important that we recognize this. Paul refers to Jesus as being the first fruits of those who have, uh, you know, in a, in a sequence, if you will, again, found in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Um, gosh, what's it around? Verse 20, somewhere thereabouts. And he mentions <clears throat> that Jesus is the first fruits. Now, the first fruits, very recognizable to a Jewish understanding because the first fruits was always the offering that was given to God. So in an annual sense, it was the first of the kind. If it's wheat, if it's whatever it may be, the crop, the first things, or even if it's the animals, um, the first of that year was to be offered before the Lord. It was the first of the kind in that particular year. In the eternal sense, Jesus is a first fruit in that he was the first to have resurrected from the dead, but never to die again. So he's the first of a kind. And so, as Paul would say, he started the whole process of being able to be resurrected from the dead, never to die again. So every believer who has ever died will see resurrection and yet never have to see a second death. So what we're studying here is beyond just important. Let me just say it as plainly as possible. If we disagree on the elements that we see here in the literal sense found in John and in the other Gospels, we will absolutely, again, if they're denied, there is no eternity for that person in the presence of Jesus. You will be separated from him for eternity because this is not something upon which we can disagree. So people may not like that. They may get angry. I may even get mail on that. I uh, don't care. It, it is just one of those things that we cannot disagree on this. If he did not resurrect, it's over. There is nothing. Every bit of hope that we have in this life is over. Again, Paul says that. So I can lean on him. He's the one who first made that case. So really, really important that we recognize that. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 15. I believe it's at verse 12 where he starts to say, So having acknowledged all these people that have seen him, how is it that you people are not believing that he is resurrected from the dead? And he talks to them about the folly of that and how dangerous it is. So it's very, very important that we recognize the the it's crucial. He has to have resurrected from the dead. And without that, we have no life. We have no resurrection life. All right. So John chapter 19. Let's, uh, let's pick up at verse 38 and let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you that you have given to us the hope of eternity. We would ask, Lord, that you would Help us in our understanding of what we are reading here and why it's important that we understand these things and not look for some alternative understanding of what is plainly here in your word. We ask, Lord, that you would be glorified through the teaching of your word. We give you all thanks and praise and ask that you would speak to us through this. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, this is certainly one of those um, passages that it's really very, very helpful to look at the other Gospels. Now, in doing so, um, there are, are people who would say that we have a contradiction here. And uh, the contradiction basically goes along these lines. Um, it seems as though the narrative about who saw who, when, and who was it, and all that stuff, it gets all clouded, and, and people think that it's contradictory. Let me give you the other references. If you don't have it in your Bible, it gives you it straightforward. Uh, Matthew 27, starting at verse 57, and uh, Mark 15, starting at verse 42, and then Luke 23, starting at verse 50. Those will all start you in the whole chronological series of events. Now, what we're going to read in John, when you compare it especially to, say, Matthew and Mark, you're going to think somehow, wait a minute, something doesn't add up here. I'm going to put up a graphic real quick, and it's uh, it's from David Reagan wrote on this and, and did a, what I think is a very good, concise breakdown of what happened. Here's where the controversy comes in. People look at it and they say, the women went to the tomb. Mary, uh, Salome, uh, the other Mary, not Jesus' mom, they went to the tomb early in the morning, and they saw that the stone was rolled away. So what there is is a, a Mary Magdalene speaks directly to Jesus uh, but doesn't speak to angels, and the the other women it said are are speaking to angels and didn't you know not to Jesus initially. Um, it's Mary who goes and reports this to Peter and John, all this stuff. And so there's the the confusion is well wait a minute the women were there, 
How is it that Mary talked to Jesus and the other women didn't? The problem is that the assumption is that they were all there together and stayed together the entire time. That's where the problem lies. And the scripture doesn't say any of that. What the scripture tells us is that they went to the tomb in the morning. It doesn't say anything that they stayed together for the whole time. What we get rather is that Mary Magdalene gets there, whether she's even standing next to the other women or they went at the exact same time. As soon as she sees the tomb open, she immediately leaves, runs to see Peter and John. Peter and John and her come back and they go into the tomb. She does not. That's when she has the encounter with Jesus. And some people would say it was happening about the same time. It may be that she lagged behind. And by the time that they got there and looked from, through everything and went back to where they were, that's when she had come in. That part's incidental. It doesn't become a problem. What happens after that, when Mary's gone, probably to get Peter and John, that's when the other women come there and they get the testimony from the angel. He has resurrected. Mary doesn't know that yet. Mary thinks that they've stolen the body, as we're going to see here, thinking Jews, Romans, somebody has stolen the body of Jesus for some reason. She doesn't give any of that. They come to investigate it themselves. So she gives that, and then when she comes back is when she sees Jesus. It is the, the women who give the report to the apostles, and they are told that Jesus, the, the angels told them, Jesus says, meet him in Galilee. That's all that part comes in. Uh, Mary gets that separately when she talks to Jesus. And then we all know that later on, uh, the apostles know that they are supposed to meet with Jesus in Galilee. Even a week later, they are uh, he will appear to them. Anyway, all of that stuff works out pretty well. I'm going to put up the graphics so you can look at it. Just don't get stuck into the trap of reading all of them and think this is a total contradiction. Just read carefully. Realize that you don't see Mary as being spoken of as being with the women when the angel speaks. She seems to have cut out immediately to go get Peter and John because she sees the empty tomb. And that's why the interaction of the women, either with angels or directly with Jesus, as with Mary Magdalene, is different because they're not in the same place at the same time. And they don't see one another traveling back and forth for where to wherever they were. So... It's really not difficult to reconcile if you take the time and carefully look through it, okay? One last thing on this, and then we'll look at the text of when they come to get Jesus. There's a controversy that we have, and some people are just so dead set on this, of why do you people you know, meet on Sundays because they want to blame it on Catholics? Uh, the Catholics say that we're supposed to meet on Sundays, and you're just doing what the Catholics say. So the, the uh, argument goes that they're meeting on, uh, we should be meeting on Saturdays like, uh, like they did in the Old Testament on the Sabbath. So for those people that would want to mock the people that get together on a Sunday morning because of, quote, the Catholics, I would want to say, well, you're getting together as the New Testament church based on the law and the Jews. So it's, it makes no sense for people to lose their minds over this. In fact, if I'm wanting, if you give me my choice, and say, when should we get together? Well, the first day of the week makes perfect sense to me. I don't care what the Catholics think. I don't care what anybody else thinks. This is the day of Jesus' resurrection. So the church gathering on a Sunday morning makes perfect sense to me because why am I meeting over the Sabbath? If I'm going to be getting together with the church, I'm not doing it based upon the date that God put aside for the children of Israel, people under the law. I'm not under the law. And if I'm going to commemorate, and the reason why I would gather together in the name of Jesus, why not on his resurrection day rather than a time during which he would have been in the tomb still, the Sabbath. So it's just, it's amazing. People love to disagree on some of the most incidental, silly things that don't matter at all. Um, what day we, we meet together is of no consequence scripturally. There's nothing in here that tells the church you have to meet on this day. It just makes simple common sense that a church should gather on the day that Jesus resurrected. It was the first day of the week. And so, you know, I, again, this is some, I, I might get some hate mail on this one too. We'll see. Verse 38. So after this, Jesus is put to death. After this, Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly. Why? Why secretly? Because of the fear of the Jews, he asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And so Pilate 
gave him permission, so he came and he took the body of Jesus. And look who it is with him, Nicodemus, from chapter 3 of John. Now, uh, who came to him first by night also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Uh, Nicodemus is only mentioned here in John. He's not mentioned in the other Gospels. So, also when it comes to what we know of Nicodemus from chapter 3, once again, this is a, a figure from history not known to us in the other Gospels. It took, you know, roughly, well, it took 60 years 30 to 40 after the other Gospels were written before John would give us this detail. So interesting, the, the Joseph was clearly a Jewish man, but still nonetheless a disciple and did these things secretly because he knew of the reprisal that would happen to him. And so Nicodemus, we already know about him. Jesus says, you're a teacher of the Pharisees? That idea that you're, a, you're that big of a, a deal, you're a teacher among those people of Israel? Well, they took the body, verse 40, of Jesus. They bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as was the custom of the Jews to bury. Strips of linen. Now, there's a big, a big battle that goes on, if you will, about the Shroud of Turin. And um, it doesn't say anything about him being put in a shroud and then strips of linen and then a separate head dressing, the Shroud of Turin is one big long piece. That doesn't in any way, it doesn't show us in what we have as the description here and the way that it was typical and hasty that he was wrapped in various linen strips and his head would have been, would have been bound differently, separately. The shroud looks like it's all one big piece, and it's really meticulously able to capture all the rest of it. There's no stretching. It, 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 I'm, I'm more than just a skeptic as to its authenticity. And what John gives us here sure gives the impression it's not one single piece, nor was it the single piece, and then wrapped separately afterwards. It doesn't. The, the narrative doesn't tell me that. It says strips of linen, so multiple pieces, and the head dressing is also separate. So you read that here. Um, verse 41, Now in the place where he was crucified, there was also a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. And verse 42, So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. Now, there are two separate um, places that are looked at in Israel as being the place where this all, you know, where this would have all taken place. Now, if you're looking to the west of the of the the temple, um, that's the traditional place that Catholics believe goes all the way back to Constantine's mom, and this is where they say that that the crucifixion and the burial would have taken place. We certainly know that they were close in proximity to one another because we just read that. So wherever the crucifixion was. The, the, there needed to be a nearby garden and a nearby tomb where all of this could have happened. Now, I favor the tomb as being to the north of the Temple Mount of the Old City. They would have left out through the Damascus Gate, and or if you were to, to go out through the Damascus Gate, Golgotha is within eyesight because all of the modern buildings weren't there. You'd be able to see it from walking out of the, the northern gate of the city of, Israel, or of Jerusalem. You would just look a little bit to your right and look up that way and you would see, or your right, <laughs> you would see Golgotha and you would have the Damascus Road in front of you between those two things. What you find very interestingly when you're looking at Golgotha or the place of the skull, as you start to move this way, it, the, the, the outcropping or the, the stone, the, the rock of the hill that's there begins to turn around this way and then comes over this way. And right over in this area, there is a tomb, a first century tomb. And it's in a garden. In that garden is a cistern that goes back to the first century, a wine press that goes back to the first century. And, it, and there is a garden even to this day. So it fits everything in John's narrative. I don't care what tradition says. I don't care any about any of that stuff. I do know this. Crucifixion, as we looked at last time, was intended to be just a humiliating, a disgusting, cruel way of putting someone to death. And it was intended to instill terror in the people who saw it. 
It's also something you wouldn't put him up on a hill because there was the placard that said what his offense was, king of the Jews. That needs to be done low to the ground so that people can see it. And the closer to the street it is, the more you would want to do it. So with all that being said, uh, if you're going to take the view that it's to the north, we go and visit this place when we're there in Israel. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating place to, to go and look at because it may very well be the exact place. Whether it's the exact tomb, even if we could prove that this was the Golgotha and this is where it all took place, you can't prove that that's the tomb, but it's the only one that they find and it is attached to the same stone structure as Golgotha. They're separated by a couple hundred yards, two or three hundred yards maybe, if you were to just snap a line between them. So not a big area, but nothing in Jerusalem is. It's a tiny place when we stop to think about how how small of an area all of these events from the time of his from the time of the upper room, if you will. Let me just say it this way. If if I was to believe that I was standing in pretty much the location and I wanted to walk from where the upper room would have been, somewhere in that district, walk over to the Garden of Gethsemane, walk over to where Caiaphas was, if that's really where he would have been. Proximity-wise, it's probably a very good idea that it's there. I could walk from there to the Antonio Fortress and uh, to you know other things that would have been taking place there, the scourging, all of that. I could have been to that very simply and been to the, um, uh, to the, the Garden Tomb. I can do that in in a matter of probably hours walking at a, at a decent pace, not even hours, like maybe a couple of hours, you could go from one to the other to the other if you were unimpeded. So, you know, we want to put it out of our minds that somehow this is just impossible to do. It's not. It's actually very close by. So, um, with what John says here, he tells us Joseph and Nicodemus show up. They get the body, they get permission, and they prepare it, and they put it in. They do so hastily because it is Passover. And everything starts to shut down, sundown on, uh, in this case, Thursday, normal uh, Sabbath Friday. If you want to look it up, there was a different kind of, a, there was a dual Sabbath that was going on. As we can best tell, that's how you work out the three days and three nights in the tomb. Um, if you don't understand all that and you want to, uh, and you can't find it on your own, send me an email and I'll send you some details on it. So chapter 20 tells us this. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went out to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw the stone that it had been rolled away from the tomb. Looking at the other gospels, you're going to see that it says that Mary and the other women. This gives the impression that Mary went before anyone else and the other ones could have come after her. Doesn't say how long, could have been almost immediate. But it shows her as being the only one here. So John's giving us an incredibly detailed narrative about this. And he has information and detail that you don't find anywhere else. It's very general what we hear in the other Gospels. Women went to the tomb. Here we find out it's Mary first. Now, when she sees this, verse 2, she ran and she came to Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. That's John identifying himself. She says they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So we're not sure. She, Peter, John, what do we do? Therefore, Peter and the other disciple and, and uh, went out, rather, Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there. Cloths, plural, all the strips that they had embalmed him with. Says nothing about one tapestry. Says nothing about what we would think is the shroud. And then it says this. Stooping down, looked in. Uh, this is John speaking of himself. He saw those things. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and saw the linen clothes uh, cloths lying there. Now, this is kind of fun. Here John's giving us an eyewitness account, and I just find it kind of funny uh, because you know you can you can uh, chuckle about this a little bit because if it was like typical, you know I don't want to diminish the seriousness of this, but John gives us the detail. He goes, "Look, I outran Peter getting there." So um, the second part of that is that Peter gets there later, but who's the one that goes in first? Peter. He's like, "This is 
typical of Peter. Sometimes he did things that we would think are just kind of way too spontaneous and impetuous. And oftentimes it had it had the effect of goofing up things. Uh, in this case, you just got to love this zeal because it is it's also going to be seen in the last chapter of this that wherever Jesus is, Peter wants to be where Jesus is. He's just dedicated to him. He just does kind of silly things from time to time. But I, this man's dedication is so infectious and wonderful, and, and it's such a blessing to see it. So with that being said, here we have uh, Peter showing up after John. John's just stooping down and looking in. Peter, on the other hand, goes immediately in. Uh, John is on the outside looking in, but he can see what things are there. Now listen to this, because it's, so it's so important. So it says the second part, cloths just strewn about on the, uh, on the, uh, around, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the other linen cloths, but folded together in, it, uh, in a place by itself. Now the folded together means coiled. The, the actual word here, it doesn't you know, talk about folding it over like you would do a, a sheet or a towel, but rather it was kind of coiled up and it was done separately. Now there's a lot of speculation as to why that is, but it, it does if nothing else, it shows that there was a great deal of care with it rather than just rip it all off, which if he was stolen, that would not be it. I mean, if you're going to steal the body, you're not going to be careful about wrapping things up and making it just so. Here in this case, the way that it looks, if nothing else, would give the impression this was deliberate and thoughtful of the way that this had happened. Now, here's what's cool. From John's own description, the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed after Peter had gone in. Now, something tells John, not something, we all know, that it's confirmed in him. The Spirit tells him this. What you're seeing here is too orderly to be some just quick, let's get the body out of here kind of a thing. So if you were able to ask John, when was it that you actually first believed? When did it really come to you who he was? John tells you right here, this is when I believed. Now, the, the word here is ido in the Greek, and it's a verb. So it's the, it's the I believe kind of a thing. Now, it's, it means knowledge. It's coming to the idea of knowledge. Let's read it one more time. So it says, um, verse 8, the other disciple who came to the tomb first, when he went in, he also saw and he believed. For as yet, to that point, they did not know the scripture that he must raise again from the dead. So, they knew what he had said. There is the, the Greek word, it's gnosko, and that would be the verb. The gnosko would be knowledge. Gnosis, G-N-O. Gnosis would be knowledge. To have gnosis, it's a verb, it's an action, it's to know something. That's not the word that's used here. Instead, it is, I have a full understanding of it. It's not just knowledge, it goes beyond that. It is, I get it now. It all makes perfect sense. I believe because of the knowledge that I now have. It's been confirmed, all the things that Jesus has said. We know what he used to say. Now we believe it. It's confirmed with us because here's what we see is an empty tomb and all the things that were part of his embalming and keeping him like any other dead person are now cast aside carefully and he's not here. Because he had told them that, it's like, I get it now. The lights come on. That's what we want to make sure. John is telling us, we know what he said, but for me personally, John giving his first hand account, this is when I believed because that is when it finally came full circle and I understood. That's what John is telling you here. So verse 9, for as of yet they, disciples, did not know, understand, confirmed. It's that we get it, the scriptures. So then uh, the disciples, they went away again to their homes. So notice in this part here from this time, Peter and John went back to their homes. No encounter with the women, the other ones, Salome, Mary. They've only spoken with Mary Magdalene. They went back to their homes. It doesn't say that Mary Magdalene went with them because now something else is going to happen in the life of Mary Magdalene. Now, but tells us Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. 
And as she wept, she stooped down and she looked into the tomb. So Mary goes to get Peter and John. They run. She obviously comes after. They're not traveling as a group. She's not with the other women that we get from any of the accounts because her interaction with Jesus is unique to her versus what is said to the other women. So you can look at the other Gospels and piece them together. Take a careful chronological timeline and you'll see that there's no contradiction here. So Peter and John get there before Mary. They see what they're going to see. They go back to the homes. Things are going to be happening. A lot of things are going to be happening later that day and for you know weeks to come. Mary comes after them, stays around the tomb, doesn't go back when they come back, whether she even saw them or not. We don't have those details. doesn't matter. She's not with them. She stays behind at the tomb. So she stays there, verse 11, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb and saw two angels in white uh, sitting. So in the tomb sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus lay. Okay, great. So this is, again, detail that's different from the other accounts. So they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was him. Interesting. Some would say it was still dark or that he wasn't looking at her. Um, he may have been doing something else. You know, not, it wasn't, you know, that face to face, just very close proximity. However it is, she didn't recognize him. I want to stop real quick because Mary Magdalene, the, um, the place where she's from is Magdala. And we know that Jesus had cast seven demons out of this woman. Now, Magdala versus where Jesus would have been at Capernaum. If Capernaum is here, that was his base of operation up in Galilee. Okay, so if you're looking at the at the Sea of Galilee, and let's just make it an oval shape, kind of is. So if it's an oval shape, Capernaum is just a little bit above the northern. It's on the just above in the northern half along the coastline that's on the west coast. She's from Magdala, which is a little bit further down towards the south, but along the same coast. Easily, you can walk from one place to the other. It's not far at all. So her proximity to where Jesus was, no problem. Jesus was all throughout Galilee. There's not a place in the area of Galilee that he wouldn't have visited and been around. We know that. He taught in all of the synagogues, we're told. So at some point, when he meets Mary, she's demon-possessed, and he casts out the demons. She is probably, I guess you can say, you know, you can throw in some of the disciples, uh, the apostles, if you want, however you want to say it, but Mary is different than, than the other characters that we have. Her dedication to him is absolutely stunning, and I love it. I absolutely love her, her you know, zeal for him. And so she's the one who brings all these reports, and then here he's going to meet her separately, individually. And it's just, it's just so cool. So she sees these angels. They say to her, why are you weeping? She says to them, because they have taken away my Lord. Now, when she had said this, um, she then turned around, saw Jesus standing there, but didn't know that it was him. So there's lots of speculation as to why she didn't recognize him. Was it just for natural reasons or because, you know, things have, have you know, the, is it because of his disfiguring? You know, it, it's just very, very hard to say. So verse uh, 15. Now, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And who is it that you're seeking? Or whom do you seek? And she, supposing him to be a gardener, somebody who worked there in the garden, tending those things, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, then tell me and uh, where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Stop for just a moment here, because, again, she's as devoted as any of his followers. She knows that he has said this. Remember, he has told them, not only the disciples, or not only the apostles, but in general senses. He says, when we go to Jerusalem, here's what's going to happen. I'll be betrayed into the hands of the Jews. They will deliver me to the Romans. I'll be put to death. But on the third day, I will raise again. All of them heard that. None of them seemed to really believe it. So at least, at least they, they, were more, they were more convinced by circumstances. The one who we said would, who we've been following is now dead. 
That's what they, they're thinking. And it seems like they just forgot everything that he said was going to take place. Each one of them individually is starting to come to that point. Peter and John by this time are going, he's resurrected. Now, the women by this time um, have also probably had their encounter with the angel who says, he's not here. Why do you seek the living among the dead? You know, this is exactly what he said was going to happen. Now go tell the disciples. Okay, great. So this is all taking place. Now, verse uh, 16. She says, just tell me where he is. If you've taken him, I'll take, I'll, I'll go get the body. I'll, you know, let me have him. Um, again, she's just thinking it really is over. It's not resurrecting because they're looking at him. If he, if she thinks that the gardener took him, she doesn't think that Jesus resurrected like he said. So then Jesus says to her, or said to her, Mary, she hears his voice. He calls to her. There's something incredibly familiar about this. Now look at immediately what happens with her. It's so cool. So, Jesus says to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and to your God. In familiar terms of what he has already said. Now, when you read the thing that I put up at the beginning, there is speculation, and I had said, has he already uh, appeared to the um, uh, to the other women? If it is as some speculate, we know from chapter 9 of the book of Hebrews that it tells us that Jesus went into a heavenly uh, holy of holies and he offered his own blood as a sacrifice for sin at the mercy seat, perfectly in keeping with what needed to be done about sin in the Old Testament sense. The, the high priest would have to go for the atonement of sin one time per year and offer blood as a sacrifice on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was and the mercy seat was the covering to it. What Paul tells us, I believe Paul wrote um, Hebrews, Paul tells us that Jesus went into the heavenly tabernacle and did the same thing. So he offered his own blood. And so the idea that he tells Mary, don't cling to me, I have yet to ascend, is that ascension to the Father to do that, the formality of it, and to offer his own blood so that when he comes back and speaks to the women, they're able to worship him and, you know, they, they're able to embrace, you know, is this, the speculation, is this Jesus saying, don't hold on to me yet, I'm only here for, for a moment, I have things to do, I'm, you know, going in and offering his blood. Again, it's speculation, but we do know that he did it, he had to have. Uh, when did it take place? Could be here. It's why he says what he says to her differently than what he says to the others. Um, some people also speculate, don't cling to me. as like, I'm not here for a length of time at all, not because I have something to do, but I'm going away. I'm not going to be staying here long. So again, it, none of those would be necessarily wrong. It's just interesting speculation. So verse 18 says this, Now Mary Magdalene came, and she told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that she had spoken these things, or that he had spoken these things to her. So again, sounds perfect. She's bringing the same report that the other women are bringing to the disciples, but the message that the, the other women get is from an angel to them, or from angels, and they go back and tell the disciples, and the message is also, wait for me at Galilee right? I'll meet you in Galilee. Here, what Jesus says to Mary has nothing to do with Galilee. She just simply says, I've seen him. He spoke to me and he told me to come here and tell you that he is resurrected. So the eyewitnesses that come to the disciples are multiple. It's the women who talked with an angel. Um, and then it's Mary who spoke directly to Jesus. They come back telling the same story. So the ones who said angels mentioned these things um, are able to say, we were told to come to you that he's been resurrected and he'll see you in Galilee. Mary comes and says, I saw him personally and he's, he's risen. Great. More things are going to happen that evening. And uh, the, you know, the, the, it's to the, not all of the disciples necessarily. That's why you can say to the disciples in general, possibly, you know, see you in Galilee. There's still a lot of speculation as to why he would say, go wait for me in Galilee, and they didn't go immediately. And Jesus himself is going to appear to them. He's going to appear to Thomas even later than that. Thomas won't be there the first time. So um, what we get in verse 19, we get to that same day at evening. Now, I want to stop here because I, it's to me it's important 
that I keep them somewhat disconnected uh, because it's a transition. Things from the morning and now it is to that evening and something that he is going to do with the disciples, I think it requires careful examination. I believe this is when you would say this is the this is when the disciples that are gathered there when Jesus comes in, this is when they are spiritually regenerated. This is when they become born again, if you will. I believe that's what we are going to read, and I'll go through that with you and then what they're able to say. So um, let's stop here. And again, take a look through that carefully if you like. Look at the other Gospels, the, uh, the printout that I gave or I put uh, up at the beginning of this. Um, you can screenshot it, save it yourself, or, or print it, or just go to the, the uh, web link I put there. It says David Reagan, and then the location of the website if you want to go look at it for yourself. If you have questions on what I presented here today, I know it's a lot of information. And uh, we're at the beginning of March uh, 2021, so as I'm recording this, uh, the, the celebration of the week of his time at Jerusalem and then his death and his resurrection. So from triumphal entry of that Sunday to his resurrection, that's just weeks away. So um, a great time to go through all this and become very, very familiar with it. We'll be looking at it in these next weeks uh, to go through of all the things that happened from the time that he was arrested until the time that he gives the church the final uh, marching orders, if you will. Because by this time, the church is birthed. It is a new covenant entirely because it's a covenant in his blood, as he has said in his own words. And that covenant of his blood means that it's a new era. It's a new time. It's the time of the church. So um, it's the timing of this is really, really very, very cool to be able to share this with you now, given what time of the year we're in. So if you have questions about this, you know how to contact us. You do so through the website. And the uh, address for that is oldpaththeology.net. And uh, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, do so. Share it with your friends if you find these useful and if you find the teachings helpful. Uh, just a great thing to be able to go through the entirety of Scripture, chapter and verse, book by book. Um, keeps us from getting into all kinds of opinion and trying to just pick and choose topics that we want to deal with. Taking the Scripture at face value from beginning to end means that there is nothing that is hidden from our eyes. We take it all in. And I find that to be very, very helpful. It's how I learned, and hopefully it's helpful to everyone else as they learn the word as well. So that's where we will pick up next week is in verse 19 of, uh, of the 20th chapter of John. A different part, transition. It's the disciples. It's that night. And the events are absolutely stunning. We'll pick that up next week. So I pray that God blesses you uh, until next week as we gather together for the rest of chapter 20. <music>